That's cool, Kevin. Got your eye Yeah. Okay. It's a good way to do it, though. It's All stationary. Right. How did you get into your counseling work? What were the circumstances? The, 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 after being involved for 14 and a half years in two different Eastern groups, I decided that I wanted to forego any, you know, any involvement in um, religious technologies or anything that had to do with religion. Yet, I went to uh, a Cold Awareness Network conference, and there I met an ex-counselor, a man named Kevin Garvey. And as I was telling my story, he said, oh, your story is, is compelling and, you know, it might be helpful. So I have a case in three weeks. Would you like to come along with me? <laughs> and I, that was more or less how I got involved. And once I started to do the work, it, it was so gratifying and so um, intellectually challenging that I couldn't put it down. It was one of those moments where I thought I can take all my desire to help other people in the group and maybe transfer them to this work and actually make a change in people's lives as opposed to in the groups I was involved in, sit in silence and hope that our vibes were going to change the world. So I realized it might be a person by person benefit or you know that my story uh, wouldn't be wasted and therefore, it was uh, it would be a good use of the 14 years that I spent in two different Eastern groups. There's also the idea that my postdoc, if you will, education was in being an occult. How do you use that in a way that's productive? And um, doing exit counseling and working with families and educating people who've had struggles in this area really seemed like a good use of, of the time so that it wouldn't be, wouldn't be wasted and, and people could benefit. Very interesting. Dave? Yeah, <clears throat> well, I left my group as a walk away, and uh, a big factor in my departing my group was a suicide of a friend who was in the group at the time. And so when I left the organization, uh, th it was a learning curve. That's the best way I can put it. And it took time uh, to you know, really figure out <laughs> what was this all about. Now, in terms of the being exposed to exit counseling, it was basically a response relationship. In other words, I didn't seek this out as a career path. Now, we're talking uh, 1974 when I left my group. And so it took a couple of years and uh, I started formal education. And during my schooling, I was getting calls from parents. And the reason for this was uh, there was a local group that was very active in our area, uh, it had been called the Forever Family, and then it became the Church of Bible Understanding. And I had actually had debates with this leader. I mean, I was on their property debating because I had friends that had been exposed to them. And so I went and checked them out. And the thing that really struck me about different groups I was being exposed to, the Unification Church was another one in Powhatan Village. I had actually gone to Divine uh, Principal Lectures the reason why I'm bringing this up is by the time I got to the Dole Gathering in uh, Washington, D.C., in fact, uh, George Swope uh, <laughs> was one of the first people that I met in terms of uh, the cult experience, and the commonalities between the group is what struck me. Even though they came from very diverse backgrounds, very different doctrines, there were familiar, similar characteristics. Now, in terms of the exit counseling part of this, uh, because I had been debating this leader in different uh, areas, uh, people knew that I was doing this, and so I had parents who actually came up to me and, and talking to me. I had started to learn about this phenomenon, and the, and the whole thing about learning about it was the mind control issue. Uh, Walter Martin was one of the first ones. He had psycholo psychological structure occultism. That was a psychological chapter. So this mind control thing was an early phenomenon that was just getting off the ground in those years. And so my involvement in doing exit counseling work was my experience that I had with myself, my friends, and others, and families that were looking for help. And what was very interesting was I started helping people, literally helping them. And so that, in, that evolved into the exit counseling category. And then I heard about Dr. Margaret Singer. This is back in 1976. She had been at John Hopkins University 
I was invited to the first gathering of exit counseling, people that were doing intervention. Back then it was exit counseling and deprogramming. But I'll never forget the letter I got from Marty Dan, the exit counseling category I, I had received from that invitation. So he was in New York, uh, Margaret was in New York. These were the, this was the early years when things were just organizing it on the exit counseling side of things. I was known for doing my voluntary work. I didn't have a deprogramming team that went on and grabbed people, so, so to speak. I didn't have that. But what I did have was voluntary access to families that were looking for help. And those, I was cutting my teeth at this point. You know, I was learning the fundamentals of working with this. And then I heard about Kevin Garvey that Joe mentioned. I met Vanessa and Kevin at the same time. This was again in the early years when the New York chapter was just beginning with Health Awareness Network back then. It wasn't called CAN at that time. Like that came later. Uh, so the whole involvement with doing exit counseling was actually beginning to work with families directly and then with my formal training and then I was getting specialized education from people like Margaret, Dr. Jolly West, Dr. John Clark. I was beginning to go to these professional uh, seminars and then not only that but then I was getting more serious uh, academic study in this. Uh, I remember Dr. West had a special course in the West Coast back in the early years. I actually attended that. And these, again, this was building block stuff back at this time. That's really what got me started with exit counseling. Thank you. Matthew, what are you doing? So I have a, a, a different uh, path into this. In 1978, I was involved with uh, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi at his university in Iowa, and Jonestown happened. And it was the first day, when that happened, it was the first time I ever missed a meditation. It sort of freaked me out a little bit. And then I read uh, Snapping, and I was thinking, well, are, are, am I in a cult? And uh, so I was reading the things that they talked about, and everything they described, we were different. You know, we had to sleep eight hours a night, they were doing sleep deprivation. They had to, uh, we had to have good organic food, they did not. So it was confusing to me. So I went to New York City during the spring break, and I hung out in front of the New York Hotel to try to get recruited because I wanted to understand what a cult was. And so I actually did this three times and I went through the three day lectures. I was trying to understand, you know, what is it? And it, it just didn't gel with me. And then I uh, fast forward to about 1983, 92, 83, um, my sister joined a group, the Way International, and my parents flipped. Um, they didn't really, were just concerned about my, my TM involvement because I went to an accredited university, a Hindu university, nonetheless, but I went for four, uh, five years. But my sister had had this rapid personality change. She had uh, taken her kids out of Catholic school. She was gonna move to Ohio. It was not a good uh, uh, situation. So my dad asked me to come to talk to her. I'm like, I don't wanna go talk to my sister. She's crazy, I'm a good outstanding Hindu young man. And she's like, you know, spouting this uh, Christian ideology, and I had no desire to hear about it. But he asked me to go talk to her, and he said she's cut everyone else off. And he said, I've never asked you to do anything, and I've supported you in all the endeavors that you, you uh, want to support it. So I went down to talk to my sister, and I convinced her that uh, there might be something wrong with what she was involved in. I was fully involved in my group. I lived in a community of meditators, and I convinced her to come back to Philadelphia to meet a friend of mine, who I really never met, which was uh, Lois Patton, uh, Marge Patton's daughter. And Lois came to my house, and she sat down in my living room and began talking to my sister for three days. And as she was describing how groups work, how influence works, how hypnosis works, I was sort of like getting very nervous because it was so much like my experience. So everything was directed at my sister and Christianity, and I just sat back and watched and listened. And it was the first time I allowed myself to really begin to ask questions. And so I guess my first intervention was while I was in a group, um, because I structured <laughs> this event with my sister uh, in a way that she could hear it, and in, in, a, in, in some sense, the way I could hear it. And then uh, I ended up suing the Maharishi and the Maharishi University for fraud and for negligence, 
where I met uh, Dr. Singer, Dr. West, who are your expert witnesses, and uh, went to a Cult Awareness Network conference. I met Dave, and met Joe Zimhart, and Joe Zimhart and I hit it off, mm -hmm. and he, he had yeah. just started doing interventions, and he said, uh, would you come with me on an intervention? And uh, so that was the end, of, <laughs> and the end of my other life, and the beginning of this new life, of doing interventions. And again, it was not anything I sought out. Um, I had a business, I had employees, we had, we had 125 employees at retail stores. The last thing I wanted to do was to you know, run around the world uh, helping people, but yeah, I was so fascinated with, uh, with people and what made them you know, uh, uh, adhere to these different ideas. I think that's what drove it. And so I guess so it's been going on <laughs> for a long time, yeah. 34 years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, three of you are terribly articulate and it's uh, a fabulous to listen, listening to this. We'll continue now. Um, how would you describe your approach and how did it change over time, if at all? The approach to uh, exit counseling yeah, has changed it pretty subtly yet dramatically over time. So. It started out um, at, you know, I'd get a phone call, I'd be on the phone, and then the next day I'd be out working with the family, trying to help them in any way I could, always usually with a colleague, um, and or I'd be invited on it on a, a uh, intervention with one of the people in the field. I've, I've worked pretty much at one time or another, you know, with, with most people who are still in this field. And um, in the beginning, uh, I would say that um, it was more confrontive and maybe a little more direct. And over time, I, I learned that being um, less confrontive and maybe more subtle in general was, was really helpful to considering where that person finds themselves at this moment in their life. And so we developed a strategy and a structure for reaching that person um, that, that took into consideration where they, where they are now and what the family's concerns are so that we could balance out the picture for the individual who's involved in the group. Um, let's talk about you know, what you like about your experience. Let's talk about what your parents are concerned about and then let's talk about the dynamics that we see operating here. And so that process of really codifying more of the process, it took many years to develop. And I think it's just, you know, for most of us, I think the comfort level uh, develops over time and you become confident in your knowledge base as you see it having an effect that's positive and families become happy with the work you're doing and you become satisfied with the results. So I think that that process of change as it developed over time, um, we, we've, I've seen it in, in all of my colleagues in this field. You know, they've, um, from, the, from the beginning days where people were literally picked up off the street and, um, you know, taken to a location and, and you know, parents felt, they had no other resource, they had no other recourse uh, to, to reaching their loved one because every other attempt resulted in nothing. So the result of that is that uh, the individual sometimes was traumatized, uh, sometimes the results were, were quite good and everyone was happy, but that, that opposite effect is something that we had to consider. So, we tried to find ways and uh, where the person would be, their individual rights, of course, would be respected and uh, the family's concerns would be delivered. Both of those things, I think, were essential to finding a way, a path, toward a more reasonable, balanced approach, considering then all the information that we had taken on in those years, looking at the experts, um, you know, and everyone, Michael Langoni and, and Margaret Singer, keep getting mentioned, Jolly West, of course, and people like Dave and, and Joe Simhart and, and others in the field who I, I learned a great deal from over the years. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Dave? 
Yeah, I'd say, first of all, in terms of exit counseling, it's an acquired skill. <laughs> and in terms of sensitivity, I think that's a major element that we need as, as, in the work of exit counseling. I would say, fundamentally, my approach is an educational model. The one <coughs> concern that I have, if you cross that line into therapy or strategic intervention therapy, that kind of thing, now you're getting into a mental health discipline. Not only that, but there's now you're talking behavior techniques. You're talking things like this in terms of influence. Uh, I do believe in terms of when someone's involved with a cult, you're definitely dealing with a set of influences that affected or impacted how they got there. So in terms of the approach that I take, it starts with family communication. I mean, usually the family is the foundation for the access to the person. So you really need to meet with the family and really uh, assess the, the communication skills that are involved with any family. Uh, and it's not always a family. Sometimes it's a significant other. Uh, you can have a romantic involvement where uh, it's a boyfriend and a girlfriend, but that person who's contacting you needs help just like a family would, and the concern that they have is the welfare of the individual. So um, in terms of the exit counseling approach itself, when you're meeting with someone, uh, it's really how do you get the communication starting to begin with. So I look at the history of the family and the background of the group. Those two things are critical in terms of the exit counseling because it affects how you're going to approach that particular situation. And so having a quality education about the history of the group, for example, is very good, but a quality education about the family itself because each family you meet is a new family. <laughs> and there's particulars with each family background, so you have to be adaptable to the context, to who you're dealing with in terms of that family and its history. Because some situations, you can't actually do the intervention. I remember I had one case in Texas where we had good intentions, but when I got there, there was a full family meltdown. In other words, instead of the intervention doing what it was supposed to do, it turned into a family feud. It's the only time I experienced that was once, but I will never forget it because it taught me to be sensitive about what are the family dynamics that you're going to be encountering when you enter that situation. The other part is the group itself, and we get a lot of calls about unknown groups. Now, in the dinosaur era when there wasn't the internet, <laughs> information was, 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 was valuable, but it was mailed to you, or you went to bookstores, and I, 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 I Joe, I can probably relate to this. The book trade. The book trade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah. Philadelphia. Or yeah. bookstores where yeah. you have to gather this material. I'll never forget Kevin. Yeah. It was an encyclopedia yeah, of was, information, yeah. and he really had done his research. I mean, I highly respected Kevin in terms of the levels of research that he was involved in. I had a similar thing. But what's very interesting about our kind of work is you tend to get categories of referrals. And what I mean by that, if you're a Bible specialist and you get Bible cults coming your way, if you're into New Age or Eastern groups, those tend to flow to the people that have backgrounds with New Age and, and Eastern. Kevin, for example, psychotherapy mm -hmm. or your mass therapy or these type of these things. You know, he was very good at certain groups and he got those kind of calls. Similar with me, the groups that I know the best and the most about. There are the referrals that tend to come my way. And what's interesting is, is that we're responding to these referrals. I'm not recruiting the referrals, I'm responding to the referrals that come to me. So the exit counseling approach, I do believe at its core, is the individual you're talking about. And how do you respectfully engage that situation, especially because you have to work with the family. So when I talk about the educational model, I'm really not a manipulator in terms of behavior change. I'm not saying behavior change, everybody manipulates. I'm not talking about that. You're dealing with influences that somebody needs to be educated about. So my mission in terms of exit counseling, education first. I don't use hypnotic techniques on people when I work with them. I educate about hypnosis, but I won't actually practice hypnosis, especially without the person's consent. So, you know, there's like ethical issues at the core of my approach. There are boundaries I won't violate, and mainly because if I'm in that situation, I don't want to have being tarred and feathered with, you're a hypocrite. And you know how hard it is to get 
feathers and tar off you that my stuff <laughs> gets all over here. So, you know, you know what I mean? It's I need to be above reproach in terms of the approach that I am taking. How do I know you're not doing to me the very thing that the cult is doing and you're pra- uh, you're no different and I've had those kind of arguments. So let me take it I take yeah. it that uh, uh, there was not a great change in your approach from beginning to now but that uh, you may have refined things or not. Yeah, you refine it because you learn more. Over time, Joe had described it uh, in his his expression, there are things, like for example, mediation. There are serious things you can learn from the mediation, or the professional mediators that do that for a living. There are valuable things that we can learn from things like that. And so, uh, the nature of the intervention is also a factor. Uh, Not everyone will leave their group. Some families look for better communication because there are limits on what you can do. So anytime I do an intervention, I have to look at what range is available to me to work with. And so I try to work with the family in terms of what's the best, because I want to have informed consent up front with the family, but I also want informed consent with the person that I work with in this sense that there's a respectful dialogue. I'm not imposing an outcome upon them. It's something they need education about, where they can make an ethical, honest comparison for themselves. I'm happy with the fact of informed consent. It may not turn out, like personally, the way I would like it to, but that doesn't mean I'm not gonna respectfully share information in an honest, ethical manner where they can make that comparison. Thank you. So, uh, I think to answer the question, I have to think about my own life and how I look at groups. So when I first left the group I was in, I was quite an activist, and I would describe myself as a cult fighter. So I, uh, I, I, I wanted my money back from Maharishi that I had spent, and, and, and he didn't want to give it back to me, and so I picketed his centers, I you know, was on TV, I, I was a pain in the butt, um, and uh, you know, I, I was fighting. And I think that the main thing that's changed is I don't see myself as a cult fighter anymore. Um, I, I look at myself more in someone who helps bring families together. So I look at situations one by one. So I have some basic rules that are, would be different. In the past, if there was a group called Group Y, Dr. John's group, I might have three cases from Dr. John's group. Now I would only accept one case from Dr. John's group because the advice I would give to one family could hurt another family. So I have to be very selective in who I would work with. So the idea of fighting the groups is the first thing that is sort of not part of my awareness anymore. Um, My main thought is how do we bring families together? Uh, Because I truly believe that when families come together and have communication, then they have the ability to elicit change. And there are obstacles to eliciting that change and it's usually people's uh, lack of communication. So over time, we began, uh, myself and a a couple other people I worked with, developing an approach which involved identifying the obstacles that exist within a family and why someone wouldn't want to come back to that family. Why wouldn't you want to come back? You know, what, what are the issues? And I think, again, back to my own experience, that when I left the group that I was in, I didn't tell my parents for three years that I had left because I was too embarrassed to tell them. Because I had sold them on this program, they had paid a lot of money for me to go to this Hindu university, and I was, I was embarrassed. So you have the ego of a young man who's going to go tell mom and dad. So I'd go home to visit my parents, and my mother would say, we're going to eat at 6.30, it's 4.30, you better go meditate, and I'd go sit in a room. I'm like, what am I doing? I've got to tell them at some point. I was just too embarrassed. So for me, it wasn't safe to tell them. So the first thing I think in the, uh, The approach is to try to make families safe, to identify what are the things that in the family system would be an obstacle for someone to come back. And so I always work with therapists, so we work as a team. So we identify from an exit counseling or an intervention point of view, what are the items that would be an obstacle? And then we turn families over to therapists to work on those communication problems, those issues that exist in the family, and and become very honest with, here's the obstacles and then try to identify who in the family would have the most chance of reaching the person. Um, So in the initial times, it was much more of as Joe described, phone call comes, go visit someone. 
And over the years, um, last, last maybe 30 years, it's not been that. Families call, we go through a, a very deliberate process of having them fill out lengthy questionnaires, interviewing them, then assessing the situation. So uh, the, the inter interviews over the telephone or one section, then we do a, a day sitting down with the family and interviewing all the members of the family that we can so that we can find out what different people's perspectives are. Because mom might think the person is under influence. The brother tells you, not under influence. Mom was harassing him. <laughs> you know, it's another story. And in some case, times everyone agrees. So you want to find out what is everybody's position. So we have to assess. So the, the, the first quality, I think, that our most important thing is assessing the situation. Then to deciding what can you do. So maybe you can do nothing. So that's the conclusion. Maybe we can work on strengthening the relationship so that if someone has an easy glide path back to the family. The other thing is that we could prepare for some type of mediation where the person clearly knows we're gonna sit down and we're gonna talk and mom and dad are gonna have what their concerns are and I'm gonna meet with the member of the group and say, what are your concerns? What do you think the obstacles? And we are very neutral <laughs> and we try to help families work it out. And then the third thing we may prepare for is a type of intervention. And in our case, th these things take a long time, six, nine months before intervention. Uh, and the person is almost always knows of me before I meet them, before we actually sit down. We might have had conversations on the telephone. Um, we may have uh, at least been referenced uh, there's no big surprises that all of a sudden Pat's going to show up. And then we have meaningful dialogue. And I see myself more as a mediator, where families have questions, person in group has questions, and I help translate the family's concerns to the person in a way that they can hear it. Um, because in a way, I think Dave talked about it yesterday, it's like we are, we are, we are translators of language. Mm -hmm. they're, spe yep, yeah. yep, they're speaking German, and the family speaking French, and what we do need to do is translate them in a way that it doesn't offend the person in the group. Because I truly believe that families, moms, dads, they know, you're all people in groups, their kids know what their parents think. Because parents leak like sieves their feelings. The example that I use is when my mother would call, I could tell by the sound of the ringer how the conversation was gonna go. Certainly by the sound of her first breath because she raised me. I knew what she thought. So most people in groups know that their parents like it or they don't like it. It's how can you help identify and refine what are the real concerns. And for some families, it's the person that's been being manipulated. And in other families, it's I'm concerned about their soul. So it has to be authentic. So our process is to sort of distill what are the family's issues. Not mine. I might have. A, I might not like the group at all. I might have a whole host of issues that I have with it. But for me, that's not so important. What's important is what is the family's concern, and how can we translate that to a way in a way that the person in the group can hear it and can make a decision. Because I believe that being involved in a group is almost like falling in love, falling in love with an idea, falling in love with a person, falling in love with a concept. It's not rational always. It's just it's emotional. And uh, when someone falls in love with somebody or an idea, you have to respect that. What do we want to understand what do they love about this? And then how can we sort of avoid the things in conversation that they love about it to get to the essence of it? So it's evolved in, I think, a significant way mm -hmm. over time. Wonderful. Um, can you describe uh, your relations, if any at all, uh, with the groups or that uh, your counselees were uh, uh, involved in? Well, it, it, you have to know a group in order to effectively address their issues, the individual, the family's issues with the group. So knowledge is one thing. Actually understanding their opinion of me, in most cases, uh, the groups don't have a very high opinion of exit counselors. <laughs> They're concerned because uh, they feel that we challenge their authority. Uh, we challenge the individual's membership in the group. 
And these things are not necessarily the goal of the group. So we have different goals. Our interest, as, as Pat was saying and, and David said, is to bring the family and the group member together again. And that may mean that that individual distances himself from the group. Therefore, fewer members in destructive groups uh, are not a happy time for the, for the group leaders and the group members. So you're challenging an ideology, you're challenging an authoritarian structure, you're challenging the, the, the way the, the group recruits, and you're taking a look at all these issues, and the group in general, we're talking about groups that use deception and recruitment, so they don't want these deceptions uncovered. So it would be unlikely that um, they would like our approach in, in, you know, in just openly talking about the issues that arise and openly discussing what changes might have happened in the individual's life. So we try to be both respectful but honest. And I think that the honesty can sometimes challenge the group's desire to keep covered the secrets that the group has laid down in order that the individual doesn't see the full story and the true history of the group. These all become crucial elements in helping an individual decide whether or not this group is what they thought it was and to hear the family's concerns about why they got involved in the first place. Dave? I would say relation to groups. I started with the picketing. I mean, I was part of the picketing of groups. I also debated leaders and uh, had those kinds of conversations and I watched what the groups did in that regard. I remember I had one mother uh, went up to Michigan with her. This is in the early years of, of my work and she just simply wanted to talk to her daughter. So I, there I was in the group house and they were raising, uh, hey, it's time to evangelize, it's time to witness. No matter what we did, they had some disruptive uh, response to that. That really helped shift my approach in terms of what I, I did later. Um, you know, the, I would pick it if it was necessary. I, I won't rule it out. I would if I thought it was necessary and warranted. But because I do intervention work the way I do, when it comes to group perceptions, I try not to be provocative in the sense of very confrontational with them. I don't do it the way I did years ago. Uh, I think there's a place for that. But if you're going to do intervention work, uh, you're, you're putting yourself as a high profile target and they'll go after you. Uh, the internet is a major element these days and how you have your presence on the internet affects your access to people just to talk to them. So in order to have it as a voluntary approach, I am not um, in the sort of the warfare mode with cults directly in terms of groups. So their perception of me is basically, and it's been for decades, much more low profile. Most people, when I meet them to talk to them, they really don't have a script on me that I have to battle through. I know people that do have a much higher profile uh, public relations effort mm -hmm. with the media, and they also have a very high profile public relationship on the internet, but people will not talk to them mm -hmm. because of that very approach. Now there's a public service involved there, and I think this has a tremendous value, it really does. But if you're talking about an intervention work with family who are in serious pain and very serious difficulty and all that, you need to have access, but in a way where the group is not on the war path against you, especially in a public way. Okay. So, this yeah. point I think is really important because there are people that do the public service and they're out yeah. there preventing mm -hmm. um, people maybe from joining these systems. Mm -hmm. But that is not, that can be mutually exclusive from reaching the person that's in the group. Yeah. And I think it's very, as a sensitivity, that, um, and it's critical to the yeah. group relationship in terms of counseling anyone. And especially because we have very private sensitivities mm -hmm. that we have to deal with and confidentiality that we have to deal with. There's where the group issues are very big deal. You want to protect privacy and the integrity of relationship as best as you can. Mm -hmm. we, we try to be very sensitive yeah. about that. Yeah. Let me ask you this. You can, you can start yeah. off if you want. Uh, you know, I've been out of it for a long time. And, and I remember uh, it being dangerous uh, to be um, uh, uh, a, a counselor dealing with some of the uh, members of some of these groups. 
uh, you know, somebody like Jack Clark uh, uh, had a yep. terrible time, but uh, uh, have you had any experiences like that where you really, your, your, your livelihood or was threatened, your reputation? Uh, Years ago, I was assaulted by cult members. Assaulted. Mm -hmm. So I know what it's like to go through that. Yeah. And that was another thing that helped me navigate further down the road. I remember I was in one, I worked with a family and it's in the middle of Manhattan and uh, uh, we got phone calls in the room I was in. And uh, I'm just gonna quote what they said over the phone. Your ass is grass, pal. Mm -hmm. That's what they said mm -hmm. on the phone. Mm -hmm. And so I looked and I said, we need to immediately go to another room. And these rooms had those little keyhole type mm -hmm. things in it. <clears throat> we were in this other room and I looked out the keyhole and I saw two people go right to the room that we had been in. They were actually coming towards us. So, you know, with certain groups, especially like you were pointing in the early years, there were death threats on certain people. I mean, so there was nothing you took like that. I know people that were beat up, you know, from just trying to help someone. So, you know, I'm, these days it's not the same, but in the early years it was like that. So not, uh, over the years, uh, this, has, this has changed. I think it's changed because groups have changed, and I think it's changed because yeah. people like Dave, Joe, mm -hmm. myself have changed in the way we approach groups. Um, I, I, in answer to the, the question I was thinking about, the, our relationship with groups um, and how it, 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 with the members that we counsel, I think that I, I've sort of been in a unique situation because I worked for ICSA for about 23 years, and uh, mostly at the front desk at conferences. And you know, Herb Rosedale, the former president, told me I had to be nice to everyone. <laughs> and so the, the people that I you mentioned, Dr. Uh, uh, Barker, I remember the first time she came to a conference, well, I had a lot to say to her. <laughs> and Herb pulled me aside and said, you can't do that. You're representing our organization and uh, you have to have a good relationship with everyone and treat everyone equally. And so that changed my relationship with actually groups over, over time. So uh, because of this position, and also Michael's position on uh, dialogue with groups, he, his idea that the only way that you're, well, one of the ways that you'll get groups to change is to have a dialogue with them. And, and one of the first or second issues of the Cultic Studies Journal, he published two articles by professors from the Maharishi U that I went to school, and I remember calling him up and you know reading him the right act. Why would you publish my cult's information? He said because it met all the standards, and we have to have dialogue. We want to bring about change. So only through dialogue can you really require or hold the group accountable. Once you get them on the public record, making claims about not being coercive then once you see their coercion, then you, they can be held accountable. But before that point, it's all a murky world that isn't clear cut. The more clear cut you can make it, the more you can demonstrate just where they go awry and have an effect on maybe changing that for the individuals you're working with. So I think there's two categories of groups. There's those groups that are small, like Dave describes, which is the majority, mm -hmm. or we don't know much about. We have to do research on them. Yeah. You've got to do a yeah. lot of research. And then there's the groups that come to conferences like this because they want to know what we have to say. And because of that experience of having to be at the front desk and being nice to the people and respectful, mm -hmm. I, I remember the, the Krishnas came one time and I just made sure that they, they had ordered a vegetarian meal and it contained garlic and onions. And I said to them, I took the liberty in getting you a, 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 a fruit plate because the vegetarian meal had garlic and onions, and they were like, you care enough to our concern. So we've developed relationships with groups, um, respectful relationships, that, uh, not that we agree on, on, on all things, but that, that they trust that uh, if, if we say, you know, this family, this person, this group is probably not one you want, that this family's gonna be difficult. They're respectful of that, and if we see that one of their members is having some mental health issues, and I can make a phone call to the group leader um, and say, look, th there's problems. Frequently, the group will let the person go. Mm -hmm. So I think that the idea of having a relationship with a, a group, <laughs> that kind of dialogue would not have been, wouldn't have been thought of in the past. I, I want to say, too, in terms of the, the, the group relations, one of the things that I have a fundamental and basic with any family that gets in touch with me, it's a response relationship. 
the one thing that culls are good at in terms of sniffing out, if you've had hostile activity mm -hmm. towards them, they are gonna make an issue of it. Mm -hmm. And they're really gonna beat you over the head about it. So you have to be prepared for that. But the other part of it is if I'm responding to genuine needs and genuine concerns, the merits of that need to speak for themselves in the sense that the response relationship is legitimate, especially in the eyes of the active member in terms of how am I approaching this group? Is it, from their perspective, is it respectful or is it disrespectful? If they see it as disrespectful, the adversarial nature of the interaction is really gonna get complicated. Yeah. And so what you try to do yeah. with groups that you have some relationship or some contact with is make it win-win. A win for them and a win, win for the family who's concerned. Now, this, this isn't always possible. No. You, you know, I mean, some groups are just cultic. <laughs> They're unreasonable. They're, uh, they, they have no interest in losing a member or challenging their authority. So you have to be realistic. And I think we've learned over the years that there are some people that will be unwilling to look at you as a fair arbitrator in, in a relationship with, with the parents, between the family or loved ones and the person in the group. So you come into it realistic, you try to be reasonable as best you can, but at some point you have to say, this is not going to work. These individuals will not allow a member to have a heart to heart with their family because the group is so threatened by the loss of the member. So I go back to this unique thing that ICSA provides, and that is an open environment. When uh, we were involved with the Cult Awareness Network, you, know, you were screened, they wanted to make sure that no group member was at an, a, a, an event, yet yeah, of course they were there. Um, and then Herb Rosedale at the recovery workshops, he sort of didn't really care if the group members came because they would come as a spy one year, and the next year they would come and say, well, last year I was a spy, because they were exposed to the information. And even at conferences where, you know, on the agenda, different groups speak. Um, Joe debated the, the Krishnas one year, I think, in Minneapolis. But then when there, when mem ex members of the Krishnas come to the conferences, and then there's the officials from the Krishnas come to the conferences, and there's conflict, disturbing. they'll call me, Pat, will you come in, <laughs> mediate with us. So you develop relationships of trust that I'm not gonna, you know, they know what I feel. I mean, it's, or I'd be a member. <laughs> but if you can be useful to a group, big groups often, then you can elicit change um, in a respectful way. So I think that the ICSA world, the AFF, um, especially you know under Michael and uh, Herb's you know, push of having dialogues with groups and allowing them the space uh, has helped me, I think it's helped a lot of us, facilitate people leaving in a, a much more respectful way. You've segued into uh, the last question, which is essentially the relationship uh, with uh, AFF, uh, uh, International uh, Public Studies Association. So you could continue with that idea. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, uh, you know, AFF has done inv invaluable work over the years. These 40 years and uh, you know I, I, I started getting my education within the cold awareness network which as everyone knows was you know put out of business yeah. through litigation and uh, unfortunate uh, history uh, and then you know it seemed that AFF was there the American Family Foundation to pick up the ball and that developed into ICSA and ICSA itself developed an academic approach to this issue. They had always been seen as the academic arm of the cold awareness network field, mm -hmm. and, um, but they developed more into a helping organization and became really the sole support when people were looking for some information to help them sort through this very difficult and painful issue for the families. And sometimes the ex-group members, people will have walked away from groups not knowing where to go. In the days before the internet, occasionally they'd find, you know, that there was this help group called ICSA or AFF, and they'd, they'd see information that helped make sense of their struggles, that helped make sense of their journey. You know, so many people walk away from groups and don't have a context or a place to put their experience. When they, when they hear and see AFF's educational 
uh, information, it helps them understand, wow, this is what happened to me. This is incredible. I'm not a fool, an idiot. Many others have been through this experience, so that support element that ICSA has offered over the years has helped literally thousands of people who've come through these conferences and, um, and called up for information to various people who've been involved with ICSA and AFF but over these many years. There's a tension though, I mean you have to acknowledge there's a tension because if you just came out of a group and then the, the people from your group were at a conference <laughs> and you're really angry, mm. it can be a difficult situation. Because so, that healing... Because they're, you're not ready. <laughs> and but yeah. in, in a way, what better place to have that kind of conflict where you're surrounded by other people who are there to support you? <laughs> There's therapists here. There are exit counselors here. There are specialists in different theologies. Where else to have that? I mean, it's like a, a learning lab, mm -hmm. but that's real. And I think that it's... For, for in the main, it's 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 the approach that I agree with. Um, I know it's difficult for some people when <laughs> a group leader or somebody who's a, making excuses for a group is sitting at a conference or speaking. But there's so many at our you know these events. There's so many speakers, 100, 125 speakers often. <laughs> there's so many different points of view being presented. It really creates different ways for uh, the information to resonate with different individuals, because not everyone's going to see it the same way. Yeah, I, I started by meeting George, Reverend George Schwab in Washington, D.C. at that Dole Gathering. The thing that struck me right off the bat, even with the developing of AFF, because at that time, we're talking an ad hoc mm -hmm. gathering. <laughs> you didn't have a national identity at this point. People were just gathering for the first time. But what struck me was the interdisciplinary nature of that gathering. You had lawyers, you had clergy, you had psychologists, you had mental health professionals, you had former members, you had parents. That mixture was very powerful in terms of its beginning because I was learning about the development of the Citizen Freedom Foundation, which preceded the Cult Awareness Network. But at the same time, as the years went on, AFF was to develop out of what started in the 70s. So, you know, when I saw the quality, and not just the, the, you know, Joe had mentioned the academic aspects of it, but the quality of the information, but the specialized expertise. I mean, I think in terms of AFF, that specialized expertise was very critical. When I think of uh, Dr. Singer, I think of Dr. Clark, I think of Dr. West, I think of these sort of the founding fathers of that time. Uh, it was a very powerful foundation being laid. The concept of mind control and brainwashing, I mean, the cults really went to war about that. You know, they really were hostile to the whole idea. You had those that were committed in terms of the mental health, the medical profession. This is not to have public credibility. It's not to have scientific credibility. I mean, they were on the warpath about this. What was so important about AFF and its development was the skill set and the information uh, the legal forms that were available, the, the the open debates and all of that. I think that was, all of that was a very healthy historical process. And the research. Yeah, and, and research, but the resource level of it, Pat, I think is another thing because the skill level that we've acquired are on the backs of these people yeah, these. that really helped us become equipped to mm -hmm. do what we do to this very day. And AFF played a very vital role. So with the transition into ICSA, one of the major uh, sort of paradigm shift was this dialogue, this formal dialogue mm -hmm. with cult leaders and cult organizations and um, and various you know authorities, so that you really get the pro and con interaction. I think in an intellectually honest way, but because of the relational dimensions and dynamics of this, it's a delicate dance in certain ways. I mean, really, is because there's people that have very strong, passionate feelings about this, and a lot of it comes from a very sincere place. It's just part of the historical process that we're 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 we're, we're in part of that development ourselves. We're we're actually in the history of, of making of what this is. What's very important about the uh, Ix's mission, as I see it now, is that they've raised the quality in a very serious level, especially with the conferences. 
that the organization had, and of course the extensive publications, and now we're in the 21st century. So the whole internet is this enormous powerhouse of potential in terms of how this grows and how this proceeds. Even YouTube and, you know, I was watching a deposition on the cell phones. Yeah. <laughs> I want to see the rest of the story of yeah. the Paul Harvey version yeah. of yeah. the yeah. deposition, yeah. you know? <laughs> but that's what this is yeah. these days, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Dave talks about this obviously a relationship. I think it's important yeah. to look at there were different camps, and these camps were very distinct. You had what we affectionately refer to as the cult apologists who were denying that people maybe were harmed, or at least we thought they were denying people were harmed. And really, saying that religious freedom is foremost, I don't think any of us here disagree that religious form is, well, that freedom it should is be foremost. Respected. It, should it should be respected. Be respected. We're not but when a group that yeah. calls itself a religion yeah. is deceptive, and is harming individuals, oh, yeah. they don't deserve to fly the banner of religion in, in the sense that, that we, we- I don't want to live a lie. Yeah, yeah. I'm not here to live a lie, right. and we're going to be honest about what we see, and, but it's presenting it in a way that's respectful. I think that's, 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 that's the key So, so yeah. one thing that yeah. ICSA has done is by, I remember there was a conference in Seattle where they brought what we would refer to affectionately again as the cult apologists together to sit down and have a dialogue mm -hmm. and do you know what are their issues because we saw them in a very black and white they're they're against what we're what our thoughts are and we have a different perspective and it happened to be not so it was a little bit more nuanced than that and we've got to identify for some of them and for some of them for some for, of them for because, others their positions are as fixed as the groups we are challenging they're fixed they really haven't change their approach so you, you're you can become aware of the individuals who who have moved and you know we have a respectful uh, discussion and dialogue with and then there's those who you know it hasn't been a, a growth spur of understanding well, the, the ideologues are ideologues yeah. and they, they remain ideologues that's what I've seen mm -hmm. yeah. so I think as a result of this ICSA perspective some of us have been invited to speak at conferences, I know Joseph Hart spoke at the American the Triple SSR, the Scientific Study of Religion. He was like the a programmer who was talking with the people who were totally opposed, and they had meaningful dialogue and could identify what their issues were. Uh, Joe and I had an opportunity to be at a, 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 a Triple SSR conference in in France and to speak with you know the uh, what again we actually call called apologists. One of them being someone who was the person who was testifying against me in a lawsuit that I had against Maharishi Mashoki. And so I'm sitting with this guy that you know I really didn't like because he had, you know, he, he was the one who was on their side. And we had a great dialogue, we had dinner, we had drinks. Um, and his concern, his real concern, when we when you sort of distilled it all to down was that people were being kidnapped. And he was really opposed to the idea of people being kidnapped. And when I said to him, you know, people haven't been kidnapped that I know of in 25 years or something, he goes, oh, then I don't have an issue. He said, here's my papers. Can I run them by you before I publish them? Because if there's anything that I'm saying that's wrong, I did not know these things have evolved. And I trust that what you're saying is true. So having those dialogues, and I don't think that would have happened outside of, it may have happened in other contexts, but in this particular context of ICSA, that's the kind of dialogue that's developed. It did bring the parties together. And it's at been least helpful. To open something up, and there's still a lot of work to be done, but it's a beginning. And, and, and I without AFF, I don't think it would have ICSA. Right. And the international aspect is of, of ICSA, how they've expanded beyond the borders of the US and have now moved into uh, Europe and um, and other areas, so that's really encouraging. We're getting a point of view from those across the pond. Yeah, I, I think one of the most serious public services that ICSA has, especially because of its website, is intellectual honesty. You really want that in terms of this, and the nature of a discussion mm -hmm. like this, because one of the biggest problems we have with the groups that we do deal with mm -hmm. is deception. And that is something that you have to handle very carefully. Your information has to be very accurate and the integrity of it needs to be high, especially if you're gonna have credibility and you need to go forward. Yeah. 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 Well, this is uh, 
a, a standalone program as I see it, even if it's part of the history of uh, uh, the organization. Thank you very much. Thank you.